the focus is primarily on our on our guest teacher this evening, Achan Chandasiri from Amaravati Monastery. Although she is based in Scotland most of the time, she's spending the winter, uh, the, the Vasa, uh, the period of meditation um, at Amaravati. Um, for those who are not familiar with um, with her or who are new to, to this class and to Ajahn Chandasiri, I'll just say a few words. She became an Anagarika in 1979, two years after meeting Ashan Sumedho, who had just come over from Thailand. And inspired by his teachings, she took the eight precepts and for four years was an Anagarika. Uh, if you've been to a Theravadan monastery, you will see Anagarikas are, are, are dressed in white. Um, and um, after four years of that, in 83, she took the 10 precepts uh, and there was a role which were then referred to as the Siddhadara, um, but basically a 10 precept nun. And um, she has uh, completed her, chitta, her, full, her full training and uh, is a very respected member of the senior monastic community. She's been very involved in the evolution of the nuns Vinaya training and has guided many meditation retreats for lay people and particularly enjoys teaching young people and participating in Christian Buddhist dialogue. So I'd like to, uh, oh yes, I should mention that in 2015, Ashen Chandasiri established Milton Hermitage in Scotland, where she now normally resides, except for this period now where she's at Amaravati. Unfortunately, Amaravati is closed to visitors, so it's impossible to visit her here, there at the moment. So we have the, the rare opportunity of seeing her uh, on screen uh, for this evening's class. Um, as I mentioned, the meeting is being recorded. Um, we're ably assisted by Lavinia, who is taking care of the chanting, which will appear on your screen, the chanting sheet or, or text. Uh, we also have um, in the background Imogen, who will be representing the, the, the lay community in the, uh, in the exchange that takes place when we request precepts and, and chant in response to Ashen Chantasiri leading. We will have a, a short puja, which will be followed by the five precepts, the three refuges and five precepts. Um, Chandasiri will then offer uh, an introduction to meditation. We'll sit in silence. There'll be a short talk and then an opportunity to ask questions at the end of this evening's gathering. So again, a very, very warm welcome. And it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Sister Chandasiri. Thank you very much for, 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 for taking this class. Thank you, Nick. Um, well, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here, even though it feels quite strange. It always feels a little bit strange, these virtual events. And as Nick said, normally I live up at Mill Tomb. I should correct him because it was actually 2011 that the property was purchased and I moved there in 2012. So it's been about eight years that I've been living up there. And for the time being, I'm staying down here with the nuns community here at Amarawati, which is where I had lived for about 20 years previously. So it's a very, very familiar place for me. This is actually the shrine room of the retreat center at Amarawati. This is the Buddha that many of you who've been on retreat here will have um, sat in front of. So, um, <clears throat> As Nick said, what I thought we could do this evening is start off with a, a short puja. And um, I think there's going to be a way that L Lavinia is going to put the text up on the screen. So you're welcome to join in from where you are. You're all muted, so you won't hear each other, uh, but you will hear me. And I'll begin by lighting the candles and the incense, which are the traditional offerings we make to, to a shrine. And uh, those of you who are not familiar with this, we do chanting in Pali and English this time. And uh, there's a certain amount of bowing, which is our way of showing respect to the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. So we begin now with the puja.
So uh, we now go to um, page 127. And Imogen will request the three refuges and the five precepts on our behalf. So we just need to go to that page, Lavinia, when you're ready. Maya, Maya, it is Sarane Nasaha, Pancha Silani Yachama, Dutiam Bi Maya, Maya, it is Sarane Nasaha, Pancha Silani Yachama. Tatiam Maya Maya Tisarane Nasaha Pancha Silani Yachama. So, this is a request for the <clears throat> three refuges and the five, five precepts. And uh, we'll, we'll chant in, in Pali. The precepts will do Pali and English, so that you know exactly what it is that you're, you're doing. Uh, this is a basic um, way of affirming our uh, commitment, our interest, our aspiration uh, to live uh, following the, uh, the Triple Gem, this great uh, source of uh, security in a very insecure world. So the refuge in the Buddha, that quality of awareness, each one of us has the capacity to see clearly to be awake to things as they are, rather than in some dreamy, deluded state, um, following some uh, idea about things in our mind. We're able to really touch base, to make contact with reality. This reality we refer to as the Dhamma, the truth. And the truth is apparent here and now, something that is right here, right now, and we can actually taste it, we can experience directly this truth when we're fully present. The third refuge is Sangha, the community, those who practice according to these teachings, the teachings of the Buddha. And so this is the third refuge, this is the third um, reference point that we turn to. And Sangha can also be seen a little bit like our, our conscience, our sense of what's right, what's proper, what's appropriate, what's actually going to lead to our welfare and happiness, um, as opposed to just giving a momentary uh, gratification. So the three refuges and then the five precepts refraining from taking, uh, refraining from causing any harm to other creatures, uh, refraining uh, from taking what is not given, from stealing, refraining from sexual misconduct, uh, refraining from wrong speech, incorrect speech, that includes lying, gossiping, harsh or abusive speech, and um, divisive speech um, that can cause no end of problems. Uh, and then finally, refraining from the use of intoxicants. And I know that for some people, this is, they're not ready to uh, totally refrain, but I, I strongly encourage it. Um, the world would be a much better place if nobody took any intoxicants. Um, and if you really feel you absolutely have to, then please uh, consider carefully uh, why you're doing it and moderation um, so that you don't um, get to the point where you totally lose control and lose perspective and end up doing a lot of things that can cause enormous harm to yourself and everybody else. Um, so these are the basic, um, this is the basic ethical framework that we have as a basis for our practice. Um, sila, Samadhi, Panya. So we'll talk more about that later on. So Imogen has made the request and now I'm going to chant Namo Tassa three times and then uh, you can chant it three times and then we'll go through the refuges line by line and we'll have the words up on the screen so you can follow. <coughs> Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa <coughs> 
Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Buddhang Sarananga Chami Buddhang Sarananga Chami Namang Sarananga Chami Namang Sarananga Chami Sanghang Sarananga Chami Sanghang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Buddhang Sarananga Chami Dutiam pi budam saranam gachami. Dutiam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiam pi sankhang saranam gachami. Dutiam pi sankhang saranam gachami. Dutiam pi budhang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi bhutam saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sankhang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sankham saranam gachami. Pi saranakamana nititang. Panati Pata, where of money, see Papa Dung, somebody hammy. Panati Pata, where of money, see Papa Dung, somebody hammy. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adinadana. Where of money, see Kapadang, somebody hami. Adina Dana, where of money, see Kapadam, somebody hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame Sumi Chachara, where of money, see Kapadang, somebody hami. Ame sumi chachara, where am I? Sikapadam samadhi ami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musawada, where am I? Sikapadam samadhi ami. Musawada Varamani Sikapadam Samadhi Hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura Meraya Majapamada Tana Varamani Sikapadam Samadhi Hami. Sura Meraya Maja Pamada Tana Varamani Sikapadam Samadhi Ami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani Pancha Sikapadani Silena Sukhating Yanti. See Lena Boga Sampada, see Lena Nebuting Yanti, Tazama, see Lang, we so tie. Sadu, Sadu, Sadu. Very good. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so we've prepared the uh, foundation for our meditation practice. Uh, we've um, shown, uh, ch chanted our, our respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, this beautiful devotional action we do with our body and with our speech. We've uh, determined, undertaken to live uh, according to the precepts. 
um, to live in a way that is careful, responsible, uh, supportive of well-being for ourselves and also for all others. Uh, very, very important undertaking. Uh, and having done these things, it's now uh, the time for us to um, practice to calm the mind, to settle the mind. Um, I'll offer a little bit of guidance um, as a support for us. Um, and I'm imagining that for many people, the mind is quite busy. Uh, it's the end of the day, lots of things have been happening. And so what you'll notice as we begin the meditation is there'll be, there'll be a certain amount of activity. Um, we often find ourselves remembering things that have happened during the day. But I encourage you just to not, not, not try to force these things away or struggle with them, but just leave them be and to keep the awareness focused with the breath. This is what, this is what we're going to call, this is what we call the object, what we're going to use as our focus for our meditation this evening. Um, you can, if you find it helpful, link the breath with a word or a short phrase. Uh, the traditional Buddhist word is, is buddho, bud as you breathe in, do as you breathe out. If you find helpful, you can, you can do that or find some other word or phrase. It can be quite a secular word if you, if you like. Breathing in as you breathe in, breathing out as you breathe out. First of all, though, take a little bit of time to make sure you've found a good posture. I'm going to sit cross-legged myself now because I find that supports um, an alert, bright, positive mindset. So we want to be sitting comfortably, but also um, in an attitude of alertness. We want to be nicely upright, body held up, the head held up. I like to close my eyes, but if you prefer to have your eyes open or if you're if you're feeling very sleepy also, I suggest you open your eyes. Sometimes people tell me that they get so relaxed when they meditate, when I'm guiding them, is that they fall asleep. And I, well, it's all right, but it's better if you stay awake. So if you feel yourself getting a little bit drowsy, a little bit dozy, then please open your eyes wide. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And what's interesting is that you can have your eyes wide open so that they're seeing things, but the, the awareness can be totally inward. You know, so you're with your body from the inside. How is your body feeling right now? How do you know you've got a body? This is a good question. Now, how, how do you know? What, what can you feel? What are you aware of? So really bringing the attention inwards to the body as it is right now. And we're aware of the pressure as we sit. We're aware of the trunk of the body. We're aware of the shoulders. We're aware of the head perched on the top. We try to have our head so that if we're, if we have the eyes open so that we're looking straight ahead. So not kind of bowed down or to one side or the other or anything like that, but just nice, nicely upright. And if it's helpful, you can just move the body around a little bit. Just sway gently until you find a nice, comfortable, balanced position so that you're not straining. There's a sense of ease, a sense of poise, a sense of balance. We're aware of any tension in the head and we just breathe it away, relaxing the scalp and the face, letting the shoulders drop, aware of the weight of the arms, aware of the hands resting on the lap or on the knees. Aware of the trunk of the body, the chest area, the heart center. 
the solar plexus and the belly. Taking a few very long, deep breaths, in breaths. And breathing out fully and completely. Just enjoying the sensation of breathing right down into the belly and relaxing from there. This is a very helpful way of helping things to settle. We relax the legs and the feet. We relax the back part of the body. Just working down the spine from the base of the skull the chest area, the back of the waist, right down to the tailbone. So that the body is held nicely upright, nicely poised, balanced, but without any undue strain. If during the meditation you feel pain or discomfort in any part of the body, you can take a moment or two to gently breathe through the muscles in that area, softening, relaxing, settling. And for now we bring the awareness to the breathing of the body. We're aware of the mechanical process of breathing. As the chest cavity expands, the air is drawn into the lungs. Very simple, natural process. And then quite naturally, we know when it's time to breathe out and the air is gently compressed out through the nostrils or through the mouth, whichever is most natural, most comfortable for you. And we settle the awareness with this natural process of the body breathing. Turning aside from any distracting thoughts, any distracting impressions, coming back again and again. If the mind is very, very restless, we need to learn how to celebrate the small successes. Even being aware of just one moment of a breath, even just a small fraction of a breath or half a breath, being aware of the, end, the beginning to the end of the inhalation. So something to celebrate and then perhaps we can maintain that awareness from beginning to the end of the exhalation, enjoying that feeling of letting go, relaxing, allowing all of our concerns just to settle, not, not, not attending to them right now, leaving them to one side so that we can be fully, comfortably present with the Dhamma, with the Buddha, with the Dhamma, with the Sangha. One breath, and then the next breath. As I said before, you can use a word or a phrase to further support that awareness, that present moment attentiveness to each breath as it's happening here, now.
if you find that you've been, your mind has been hijacked by some fascinating plan or idea for the future or compelling memory, whether it's a pleasant one or an unpleasant one, something that's happened in the past, just as soon as you recognize that, come back, come back to this breath. Make the mind very, very simple. Relax. Enjoy this very simple process of the body breathing as we experience it right now. We can plan later on. We can reflect on our past experience later on. But right now, we're here with each breath as it happens.
just one breath and then the next breath. And if the mind is very restless, then try taking a longer in breath and holding the breath just for a moment before breathing out. And then a longer pause between the out breath, between the in breath and the out breath. may be aware of the changing of the light <clears throat> at the end of the day the sun going down begins to get dark this is normal nature is continuously changing So in a moment or two, I'll ring the bell. Just a few more wonderful, mindful inhalations and exhalations.
<clears throat> have a bit of a stretch. I'm going to need to try to turn the lights on. I'm not quite sure how to do it, but let's see. quite ideal, but hopefully good enough. <clears throat> oh. Is that better? So meditation is a very good way of um, coming to understand the mind. Uh, coming to understand the ways that we make life difficult for ourselves. One of the things that most frequently happens with meditation is that we can um, become very frustrated because we are given the instruction to um, be with the breath and stay focused and stay in the present and you know we want to do that but unfortunately there's a kind of energy in the mind and we find ourselves thinking or remembering thinking of the future or remembering the past and as I think I've probably said already this is completely normal but how we respond is very important because um, if we respond with, with frustration or irritation, uh, the mind tends to get more active, more agitated, and quite miserable. On the other hand, if we just let it go wherever it wants to go, um, that also is not particularly helpful. So it's a kind of matter, matter of just being quite light, quite gentle with it, but gentle but firm. Um, having a kindly attitude uh, towards the mind um, and also what i do i always celebrate the fact that it's uh, this experience is helping me to understand something very important about our human existence because we tend to identify very strongly with the body and the mind we tend to identify very strongly with the thoughts that we're having you know, we assume that that's how things are, that's, that's right, what I'm thinking is right, it's how things are. But when we um, practice meditation in this way, we begin to see, we begin to suspect that maybe that's not, not totally the case. Uh, we begin to challenge uh, this identification with the mind. Uh, we begin to see that actually the mind has an energy of its own. It does whatever it wants, whether I want it to or not. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a patterning, a conditioning uh, that seems to be at work. So if we've had a very full, interesting day, then we come to sit in meditation. If we're not careful, what we find is that the mind just carries on thinking lots and lots of very interesting thoughts. Um, So it takes a bit of uh, practice and a lot of patience uh, to learn how to, to work with the mind in this way. You know, just this willingness to keep coming back again and again and again. This willingness to actually, the patience to just be with one breath. You know, very, very important because when we can do that, you know, if we could actually stay with one breath from beginning to end, there's a way that we can actually begin to enjoy it, you know, rather than it feeling like a chore or a, a kind of a, a task that we're going to fail at um, <laughs> because the mind is not going to stay with the breath. Uh, we see it as actually something that's, that's actually quite pleasant, something enjoyable. 
and even more enjoyable than all of those interesting things, the, the, the planning, the um, events of the day, and you know, even the difficult events of the day, sometimes they're the ones that stick most strongly in the mind. Mind seems to have a, a way of, of almost being drawn like a magnet to the to the mistakes that we've made, the failures, the times that we've maybe hurt somebody or hurt ourselves, you know, put ourselves in a position where we felt foolish or embarrassed. Mind is irresistibly attracted to these things, and so we torment ourselves, you know, going back again and again and again to try to recreate, rewrite the story. Uh, into something that's a little bit more uh, comfortable for us, a little bit more gratifying um, for the mind, for the ego. So it's, um, although, as I said, the practice is very, very simple, um, it's, it's not very easy uh, because of the way that we've been conditioned, the programming uh, that's there. Uh, so we need to be quite patient and quite clever. Um, and I often see meditation practice, in fact, practice in general as kind of a bit like a game. Um, I do it because I, I think of it like this, because I have a tendency to take things far too seriously and to very easily get discouraged. You know, when things don't go the way I think they should go, I can become very discouraged. And when I get discouraged, and it may be different for you, but I, when I get discouraged, I tend to want to give up. And I start hating meditation. Uh, I don't want to do it because every time I sit down, I feel like a failure. And that's unfortunate. So whereas if we can sort of think of it, you know, like learning a skill, you know, learning how to play the piano or learning how to, I don't know, to play tennis or um, how, to, how to do art, to paint, or to do some kind of craft work, um, play a musical instrument. You know, it, it, we need to practice. It takes time. I remember one, of the, one time when I was leading a retreat here, and um, I was uh, talking to some people in one of the interview groups, and particular group I was talking to, there were two people who'd been meditating for about 20 years, which is quite a long time. And there were also people who were just starting out. And um, I asked the people who'd been practicing for 20 years, if they'd noticed much change or what, what changes they'd noticed in their practice. And uh, it was very interesting because one of them said, he said, well, he said, my, my mind still wanders a lot, but I don't mind so much. Uh, and I was, I, I was very struck by that because um, uh, it showed a kind of wisdom, a kind of recognition that yes, the mind, sometimes it wanders, sometimes it settles, sometimes it takes a long time to settle. And this is just the nature of the mind. I don't have to identify with it. I don't have to see it as a personal failing. Just, it's just the mind. And I can work with it. I can you know, tame it, guide it. You know, just in the same way that we can, you know, if we have a dog, we, we can teach it things, we can train it, but we can't, we can't teach it to do anything if we're too hard on it, if we're too sharp, if we punish it too readily. Yeah. You know, we need to be firm. So, come on, this is what we're doing right now. But, um, with an attitude of, of kindness and friendliness. It's not like we're going, going to do battle with the mind, get into a, a conflict <laughs> with the mind. It's not like that at all. It's, it's more a, um, a guiding, a teaching, an encouraging. Uh, and we do need to be watchful um, because sometimes you know, some of our thinking is not particularly helpful. It doesn't, um, you know, not only is it pointless, but it can actually be quite harmful. You know, I mean, uh, like thoughts of ill will, for example. And 
one of the areas where this can be most difficult is if we, if we have ill will towards ourselves. You know, if we're very hard on ourselves, very judgmental of ourselves, very demanding, like we can have enormously high standards for ourselves, you know, much higher than we would expect of anybody else. And we can be very, very hard if we don't live up to these ridiculously high standards. And this can make us very unhappy. There's always a sense of inadequacy, never being quite good enough. And my sense is that this is something that we learn when we're very little. You know, I think I, I think I probably got it from my mother because I think she never felt she was good enough. And I think she probably got it from her mother who never thought she was good enough. And this is just me, I'm just um, speculating. I, I, I don't know, it's not a conversation we ever had. But um, I think from when I was very little, I, I, I had a sense of not, not being quite good enough. And it took a long, long time. And I think I was about 50 when I realized what I was doing and how miserable it was making me. I mean, not totally wretched and miserable, but there was never that sense of joy that I thought, you know, I should have. You know, I'd been living as a nun for many years. I'd done lots of good things. I was totally dedicated to the Buddha Dharma Sangha. I was generous. I was kind as far as I could be to other people. Um, and, you know, there was something lacking. And then eventually I realized that I hadn't, you know, I, I was very busy being good and looking after everybody else, but I'd forgotten that I needed to look after myself, that I needed to be kind to myself, that I needed to take time uh, to look after this, this being here. You know, do we give it enough rest? Do we give it enough of the things it enjoys? Or do we always feel we have to be doing things that we don't particularly enjoy? You know, being dutiful, um, serving, um, uh, doing all kinds of things for other people, but without realizing that actually we also need to take time to do things for ourselves. Um, so learning how to see meditation as something that we do out of a sense of kindness for ourselves, rather than seeing it as another thing that we're going to do, that we're going to fail at, that's not going to be good enough. Uh, can we see it as something that we do as the greatest kindness for ourselves? Can we see this practice as being something that is for the greatest kindness for our welfare and happiness? And I always like to remember that the uh, Buddha, after he was enlightened, uh, one of the things that uh, he said was, you know, he was encouraging you know, people who'd come to practice with him, his disciples, and he said, go and, you know, go and, you know, go and, and live uh, in the world, uh, go and um, you know, practice as, as alms mendicants, go and wander and one wonder for the welfare and happiness of beings. You know, practice for the welfare and happiness of other beings and for yourself. So, you know, when I think of that, I think, and having lived in community for many years, you know, it's interesting to notice, you know, the, 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 the kind of people who make you feel happy and the kind of people who you, you know, immediately see them, see them coming, oh no, you feel miserable and um, or, or concerned or worried and uh, the ones that make me feel happy are people who are happy and peaceful themselves you know not people who are kind of fretting and being too serious about themselves and about their practice you know I've got to practice 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 but more you know a sense of joyfulness that they've come upon this teaching the teach these wonderful teachings that the Buddha offered 2500 years ago were just extraordinary teachings, very, very simple and very, uh, very amazing in that they um, address every aspect of human life. It's quite extraordinary how their, you know, how the Buddha was able to present a teaching that was relevant to everybody. And it's just as relevant now as it was 2,500 years ago. And I find that quite mind-blowing. And the way that he was able to 
really understand the human predicament. You know, understand, you know, that for all of us, life is, there is suffering, there is a struggle. And yet to be able to understand, to pinpoint why, why we struggle, what the problem is. You know, of course, we're all going to get old. Well, not all of us, going to, actually, that's, that's not strictly true. Some of us will die young. Uh, but many of us will grow old. Most of us will probably get sick at some point. And all of us will die. These are things that we can't, can't escape. This is something we can't escape. No matter where we go, there'll come a time when the breathing stops and the body goes cold, rigid. That, that's what happens to bodies, they die. And this can be very scary, of course. You know, if we're strongly identified with the body and mind, the prospect of the body dying is extremely frightening. So our practice to learn how to see the body and mind for what they are. This is not, this is not our true identity. No, we don't have to identify with this. No. We can take refuge, we can, we can uh, cultivate this sense of refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, in that which doesn't, which wasn't born and which doesn't die. This present moment of awareness, being here now, waking up to things as they are right now. So investigating, studying every um, aspect of our life. Mm. We need to, have, to, to observe both when we're practicing meditation and, and also just during the day. We're noticing when we're feeling impatient, you know, having to stand in a queue and wait really impatient, or somebody walking behind somebody on a narrow pavement when they're walking very slowly. I find that difficult. But can we be really patient and just allow, allow an older person to walk in front of us slowly? Can we do that? Can we slow down? Waiting for the bell to ring at the end of the meditation. When's she ever going to ring that bell? No. <coughs> Lots of opportunities for practicing patience. Can we notice when we're being impatient? Can we restrain the mind, draw it back, come to the breath, come to the body, enjoy the moment as we experience it? <coughs> and then taking time each day just to sit quietly, you know, just to notice how the mind is, how the body is, the kind of thoughts we're having. Uh, you know, can, we, can we just notice how we're feeling? Notice if we're feeling discouraged or tired or, or optimistic, bright, positive, or confused or frightened. You know, I think nowadays, particularly with the pandemic, there's a lot of, a lot of fear, a lot of confusion, uncertainty, tons of righteous indignation about all the people who are not doing what they should be doing and we get very righteous about the politicians who are not getting it right one way or another. Tons of things we can feel righteously indignant, indignant about. Um, but can we see the effect of that kind of emotion on our minds? Does it make us feel happy? Or does it just make us feel agitated and upset? Not to condone the things that we see that are being done, that are unskillful, but more seeing if we can actually just bring a sense of understanding, a sense of compassion, seeing that these people are also human beings, that they're also struggling, that they're also probably very frightened. You know, frightened about, you know, maintaining their reputation, maintaining their position, and frightened they might lose it or be made to look foolish, blamed, judged, hum hum uh, humiliated, shamed. You know, many things that um, can make us feel very vulnerable. 
So I don't want to talk for too long because I'm aware that some of you might have questions. And so um, I think I just, you know, wanted to offer a few thoughts about practice and some words of encouragement that I hope might be helpful to you in your lives. Uh, the biggest encouragement, just keep practicing, uh, keep tuning in on a Monday evening to the Monday class and um, let's end the talk there and invite questions. So I think Imogen is going to receive the chat questions and she'll uh, unmute herself and read them out to me and then I shall do my best to provide some kind of an, an answer, some kind of a reflection. And I do wish you well. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn Tandasiri. I currently have three questions. Um, and if more come in, I will let you know. Okay. Um, first question. Um, might you off offer retreats online during the pandemic? From Madeline. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we're talking about... Um, the possibility of beginning to experiment with online retreats um, here at Amarawati. Um, it's not certain how we'll do it. The first one or two may be just by invitation, you know, just until we figure out how to do it. And then we may be able to open it a little bit uh, wider. I think one of the concerns is that you know, when we have people coming here for retreat, we have interviews and we're able to, you know, keep in quite close contact with people and offer guidance and direction and so on, on a very personal uh, basis. But we have to figure out how to translate that into an online situation. And the more we talk about it, the more we realize it's not quite as straightforward or as simple um, as one might imagine, because we do like to take proper care of people who come on retreat. And certainly with longer retreats, sometimes, you know, some quite powerful um, emotions can come up for people. And it's uh, important, well, I feel it's important that we can actually really provide the support that people need under such circumstances, particularly when they're not actually practicing necessarily within the protected environment that, say, the monastery provides. Um, you know, practicing, you know, having a retreat when you're at home is a very different thing from having a retreat here at the retreat center. Uh, I do, I mean, I think there are quite a lot of online events of one kind or another, which um, you can certainly find out about through the um, Amarwati website. And I also do um, um, meditation days through from Milntium once a month. So they're kind of like a, a mini retreat um, on a very small scale. So that's another possibility if, if you um, uh, maybe get yourself onto the Milntium mailing list. Um, and I'm sure you can find that out, out about how to do that through the Buddhist society. Um, or I can tell you, maybe that's, is that helpful? I can tell you. Um, just write to me on my email address and just let me know that you'd like to have information about virtual events and I can include you in the mailing. Um, so there are there is the beginning of online retreats. So far, I mean, I've participated in um, weekend retreats through other organizations and through Amarawati, we're, we're beginning to think about it. So that's the answer to that question. Thank you. And the second question from Susan. What is your opinion of light kasana meditation? Does one need a teacher? I'm visually impaired and I find I'm more able to do it than metta and breath mindfulness. All right. It's not something I've practiced very much myself. Um, in fact, I don't think I've practiced it at all. <laughs> um, Although it's one that the Buddha strongly recommended, um, particularly if you have problems with sleepiness, uh, to, to focus on, on a bright light um, can really brighten the mind and, and can um, 
support a sense of wakefulness. Um, I, I, I honestly couldn't say whether I would recommend having a teacher. I think I probably would recommend having a teacher if you're going to do that kind of practice. But I, I, um, I don't consider myself um, qualified to, to comment, actually. Um, I mean, you could, you could try it, and if you find that it brings good results, uh, then please um, you know, just work with it. If you find that uh, you're getting strange mind states, strange experiences of one kind or another, uh, then it would be a good idea to find uh, some, somebody who can offer you some guidance. Um, I think that's all I can say. And I'm sorry not to be able to uh, speak with more authority on, on the subject. Yeah. Sorry, Sue. And currently, um, final question, but do send any others in um, from Florence. Is mind our thoughts, or does it exist without thoughts? Yeah, mind is very interesting. It's, it's not what we think it is. <laughs> um, in fact, Ajahn Sumedha, one of Ajahn Sumedha's favorite phrases is, you know, some people think that the mind is in the body, but actually the body is in the mind. So mind, is totally vast or has the capacity, has the potential to be totally vast. Um, thoughts um, can seem to fill the mind. Um, but <clears throat> as we um, learn how to observe our thinking, we begin to notice how uh, sometimes this there's thought and sometimes there isn't thought. Uh, sometimes it's just, it's just quiet in there. I think some people think a lot more than others. I, I, I know some people who say that they don't really think very much. Um, I know I think quite a lot. Um, so how, how can we begin? To, it's, it's interesting to explore ways that we can begin to um, observe our thoughts. Because as I said, earlier on, um, we do tend to identify very strongly with the thoughts. It seems that the thoughts are all there is. Um, and over time, we learn that actually, uh, we can notice when there's thinking, we can notice when there's not thinking. And we can notice, we can learn how to notice the kind of thoughts we're having. Um, So sometimes I encourage people to, to write down their thoughts if they're feeling very distressed about something. You know, very, you know, there's a kind of, you know, sometimes there's that sort of internal rant that goes on. If somebody's upset us, or if we're feeling confused or worried about something, and worry is a very good one, because when we're identified with it, it seems to completely take us over. And there are all these thoughts. And sometimes the thoughts are so many thoughts, it's kind of like a blur. Worry, 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 worry. At least that's been my experience. And so what I do sometimes is I kind of, um, it's almost like you're having a conversation with yourself. You say, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. What, what, what's the worry? What's the problem? And then just to take time to get a pencil, get a piece of paper, and actually just write down the thought, you know, that you're having. You know, I'm worried about, um, I'm worried about the pandemic. I'm worried I might get sick. I'm worried, did I, did I sanitize my hands enough? I'm worried, should I wear a face mask? You know, there, there might be, there might be, I'm worried about what this person's going to say to me if I have a face mask on. Um, it, you know, we, we can worry about all kinds of things. But just writing it down and just, it's, it's like a way of distance, distancing ourselves from it. 
So you can, you can write down a worry. You can also um, think a positive thought. Um, you know, it deliberately introduce a positive thought. Um, I mean, even the thought, may I be well? You know, that's, that's like a positive thought. It's a positive intention that you're actually deliberately putting into your mind. Or you can have the thought, I am, I am all right. Or my practice is good enough. I do that a lot. My practice is good enough. Chandasiri, you're all right. So you begin to see that actually uh, thinking is, is kind of a habit. We have a habit of thinking. And we might have a habit of thinking very positive thoughts. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm the greatest. You know, I've done that well. You know, some people have those, that kind of habit. Other people have a habit of, mm, I hope that was all right. Or did I offend her? Was that okay? So as our mindfulness um, develops, we're able to um, observe you know, what we're thinking at any time, to notice what we're thinking. So what does that say about thinking and about the mind? It shows us that we're not actually, we don't have to identify with our thought. There is the capacity to observe, to be aware, this is a thought. I don't have to identify with this. This is just a conditioned response uh, to something that has happened. And then we can deliberately bring up positive thoughts. You know, may she be well, may they be well. It is like what we call the meta practice. You know, may all beings be well. So we can deliberately bring up these thoughts and, and notice the effect. You know, I notice when I, when I bring up those kind of thoughts, my, my whole mind kind of brightens. I feel, I feel happier, I feel more joyful. Or if I'm feeling um, angry or upset with somebody, you know, I can allow myself, you know, I can notice the kind of thoughts that arise in that situation. You know, blaming, judging, criticizing, um, you know, just feeling how, how dare she, uh, how could she be so mean? <laughs> you know, we can have all kinds of thoughts like that. But then you can also have thoughts of, well, maybe she didn't realize that she was upsetting me so much. Maybe she wasn't aware. Maybe she had a headache. Maybe she was having a bad day. So beginning to sort of empathize, to think about the other person, how it is from their point of view. You know, and as soon as you, you put yourself in somebody else's shoes in this way, then, you know, the, 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 the unhappiness and the kind of um, self-centered um, thought, thinking, uh, tends to shift. And the mind feels a little bit, a little bit broader, a little bit brighter. And then you can even think, well, maybe she's really unhappy. Maybe she's really going through a really difficult time. And you can think, well, maybe I can do something to make her feel better. <laughs> so gradually transform, transforming it. And I did it with one of our neighbors up at Miltume, this farmer who I used to get quite um, frightened of him, actually. He could be very intimidating. He was a big man, very, very clever. And um, I don't think he liked women very much. And he, you know, we had some pretty uh, difficult exchanges. And uh, then I began to think about what it must be like to be him and realizing that actually, maybe his life wasn't such a joyful life. Maybe he had, and he was quite old. And then I thought, well, and he was somebody that other people didn't like very much because he'd made a lot of enemies. You know, he'd upset a lot of people. And then I thought, well, imagine dying when you've upset a lot of people you know, and nobody really likes you very much. I wonder how that feels. You know, I imagine you feel quite, quite miserable, quite unhappy. You know, unpleasant thought to, to kind of leave, leave this, leave the body with. So then I began to think, well, what could I do to make him feel happy? And uh, I mean, my intention was to think, well, how, how can I help him to die happily? Uh, I made the mistake of sharing this intention with some of the neighbors, some of the other neighbors. And 
and they laughed because what they heard was how can I help him to die but it wasn't that I wanted with what how can I help him how can I support him in in feeling glad about his life when the time comes for, for it to end so um you know these are ways that as we begin to become more aware of, of our thinking and that it's not who and what we are we don't need to identify with it we learn to be able to to, to, to work with it in, in a very in a way that can bring benefit can bring welfare uh, welfare to ourselves and to others and uh, I mean some people you know, so I, you know I'm, I'm pretty sure that we can um, you know pick up on each other's thoughts sometimes you, you may maybe you've had a situation where you know you say something and somebody else says oh I was thinking exactly the same thing or maybe you know you think of somebody and they phone up you know, and that sort of makes me, makes, you know, it can make us wonder, you know, what, what is this thing that we call the mind? You know, is it, is it just inside here? Or is it something that is much, much, much broader, much faster? So we can focus the mind in a very small, very narrow way. Like so this one pointed focus on the breath, say, and you focus at the tip of the nose. Or we can expand the awareness, the consciousness to be, to fill the whole universe. So these are just a few reflections about mind that I hope might be helpful. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, the person who asked that question has, has sent a follow-up. All and right. I have another which maybe links on some, touches on some of the things you've just talked about. Yes. And then the final one. Um, so that sounds very complicated, but <laughs> I don't know whether it might be worth putting we them all to you now. Yes, why don't you read them all now? We'll see how they, they work together. Okay. okay. Um, so when we concentrate on our breathing, we bring it to our mind, was the follow-up question. Um, there is also another question. With less distractions during the pandemic, one or two painful life events which have not, which I have not been fully able to let go of have returned with some emotional force any advice please and the final one is attaining enlightenment only possible with a lifetime of practice or does a new buddhist stand a chance <laughs> thank you ah okay well um i'm going to bring it, begin at the end well actually I'll, I'll, be, yeah, I'll begin at the end that was a wobble by the way that was a doubt um, so beginning at the end, like enlightenment, please, as a new Buddhist, you must celebrate the fact that you found the path and you must set your feet firmly on the path and just start walking. And I don't know how long it's going to take you. And we all uh, come to this path with different histories, different backgrounds. And it may be that you've had many, many previous lifetimes of practice and you may be just on the verge of enlightenment. Um, or it may take a little bit longer. So I wouldn't worry too much about um, the fact that you're just starting. I would celebrate that and just keep, make sure you continue. That's what I would say. Um, some people practice for a whole lifetime and they don't become enlightened. Maybe they need another lifetime or two. The Buddha had many lifetimes before his lifetime where he actually uh, was enlightened. He, he, he lived many lifetimes developing particular good qualities along the way. And so, you know, for all of us, we have the opportunity now with this lifetime to, to cultivate lots of good, wholesome qualities. And if we're not enlightened in this lifetime, then maybe next lifetime. They're all, it'll, it, none of it will be wasted. Um, and if we do harmful things, then that's definitely uh, something, it's, it's unfortunate, it slows us down. Um, but we can learn from those. You know, often we, we learn more from our mistakes and from our successes. But I'd strongly encourage you to try to avoid making too many mistakes. Um, but just keep going on the path. Try to keep the precepts as best you can. Try to have a daily practice uh, where you uh, bring your mind to your breath. Uh, just focus the mind with the breath, which is kind of an answer to the first of those three questions. I can't remember quite how she put it, but uh, basically when we, when we focus on the breath, we bring the awareness to the breath rather than having the awareness uh, with our memories or our plans or 
uh, with our neighbours or with what's happening out in the street. Or, but we, we bring the awareness, we try to guide the awareness to the breath, the consciousness, focus the conscious mind on the breath. Um, we can also focus the conscious mind on the body, um, uh, relaxing in the body. And as the other questioner said, you, know, you can use an image of light or you can use a mantra. Or, you know, there's many things that you can use as a focus for the awareness. Uh, so I think I've answered the last question and the first question. And now the question about painful memories arising during the pandemic. And um, <clears throat> yes, I can imagine how this can happen. Certainly when people come on retreat very often, it's a time that um, difficult memories um, can arise. You just and and um, can you just remind me what what was it just about them arising or asking for advice about how to deal with them, Imogen? Yeah, um, with less distractions during the pandemic, one or two painful life events, which I've not been able to fully let go of, have returned with some emotional force. Any advice, please? Okay, yeah. Well, um, Yeah, this can be very, very difficult. Um, and it's also an incredible opportunity to do some extra work. I don't really like the word work, but to do some extra, um, to give extra attention, uh, extra focus. Um, Some, some painful memories, some difficult things that have happened uh, are very difficult to resolve on one's own. Um, I mean, that's why we push them down because uh, they seem impossible when the event actually happens. And it's, it's like the, the, mind's, the, mind's, the, 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 yeah, the mind's way of just dealing with uh, totally impossible, irreconcilable um, experiences. We just push them down. It's one way of dealing with them. Um, and it's a way that enables us to continue to function. Um, but it doesn't really sort them forever. It just represses them. So it gets them out of the way for a time. But it does take quite a lot of effort to, to keep them pushed down, even though we're not really aware that we're making that kind of effort. Um, but it does, it does take energy. And so when they begin to emerge at a time like this, this can be a very positive um, opportunity, a very remarkable opportunity to actually work, work with them in order to, to, to finally release them. Um, and then we'll, you know, if we can do this, then there can be an enormous amount more energy in our lives. I mean, often people say when they've, when they've allowed that kind of release, uh, they just feel so much better, so much lighter. Um, so if, if you feel that you can do this, then what I would encourage is that when the situation arises, um, to take it rather gently, try to give yourself space. If you can be with nature, that's very, very helpful. You know, find a, a place, even a, a park or a, you know, somewhere where there's a tree or um, you know, something, something just to uh, bring to mind that there's the earth and that you're part of the earth. You're part of the earth, part of the air, part of the light of the sun and water, obviously. But, you know, you, this body, this being, is part of nature. And that can help to get things into perspective. Um, it may be that some memories um, 
bring quite a strong physical reaction. You may experience things in your body. And what I would suggest, encourage, is just to try to be with that. You know, if there's a shaking, a trembling, a weeping, or whatever, just to, to try to be with that and just to be present with that. And to keep breathing through it. You know, long, slow breaths, calming, soothing, settling. The out breath is very, very helpful just to calm and to settle. So it's like, it's like managing the emotion. You know, it can feel very, very strong, very unmanageable. But if you breathe through it in this way, sort of calmly, gently using the breath to calm, to settle, to reassure, you know, and you can use words, you know, this is just a memory, this is just a memory, it's just a memory. And just to allow it to rise and allow it just to, to wash through and to, to settle. Um, there are many, many other um, skillful means that are, you know can be can be employed uh, to resolve these things. And you know, maybe sometimes it might be a matter of forgiving somebody. You know, if somebody has hurt you or harmed you in some way, just bringing them to mind with uh, the intention to. First of all, to acknowledge the pain that has happened, uh, the, the harm that has been done, and then to, to see if it's possible to just bring a sense of, of forgiveness, maybe appreciating that they, they weren't aware of what they were doing, they weren't aware of the harm that they were causing, and you know, to try to bring up a sense of forgiveness and maybe even compassion. But we always need to begin with compassion towards ourselves. Just Acknowledging this was really hard, this was really painful, this really hurt. So doing that can be a way of just supporting a settling. These are a few suggestions and um, if it's very, very strong, very difficult, then you may need to get some professional help. And you know, this may not be something that you want to do, or you may feel ashamed or embarrassed or something, but it's sometimes well, that's what we need. You know, just someone to, you know, offer us a hand uh, with some particular therapeutic technique. Um, this can be helpful just to, just to guide us through, to support us um, when um, through these um, painful, difficult things. So, in a way, the fact that they're arising at this time, that we actually have the, the, the leisure, the space, the time uh, to allow these things into consciousness, I see this as being a very, very positive thing. Um, and, as I said, there are uh, strategies that you can try yourself um, as ways of, of releasing it. Um, because the body and the mind, I mean, the body remembers everything, the mind remembers everything. And sometimes it's just a matter of being with that and uh, replacing that painful um, memory experience with uh, something that uh, can support more of a sense of well-being. Um, but as I said, sometimes we, we might need help with that. Um, so don't, don't hesitate to, to seek help if if, if you feel that that's needed, but maybe you can find a way through your, through your practice. And not necessarily just your formal meditation, but as you're going about your daily life, doing things, uh, staying aware, staying in touch with your body, and just you know, relaxing through your body, relaxing through your mind, and, and just working, working with it in that way. These are a few suggestions that I, I hope may be helpful. And I really do wish you well with it. Um, it's painful, it's difficult, it's messy, doesn't look very nice, but you feel much better afterwards. Uh, sometimes we maybe need to have a conversation with somebody. You know, sometimes that's what needs to happen as a way of resolving uh, something that was really difficult. But wait till you feel settled uh, internally 
um, so that you can uh, broach the subject with, with the other person in a way that uh, can be received by them. You know, don't bring a lot of anger, or rage or indignation. Wait, wait till you're feeling a little bit settled, if that's something that would be helpful uh, in that situation. So, um, I think we need to end now because it's 10 past eight. Um, is that okay, Imogen, or is there any other pressing matters that we need to address? That is fine. There was one further one about the photograph behind you. Um, oh, right. This one here is Ajahn Sumedho, and on the other side um, is Ajahn Chah. So these are our two uh, main teachers uh, in, in our tradition. So we often have them on the shrine so that we pen, when we pay respects to the shrine, we're also paying respects to them. Uh, Thank you so very much. I'd like to end with the closing homage uh, in Pali and English. And I, so um, we'll chant this together and we can bow to the shrine. And uh, that'll be, then, uh, then, then, I'll, uh, then I'll say bye bye after we've done that. <laughs> The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the Blessed One. Wakato Bhagavata Dhammo The teaching so completely explained by him. Dhammangamasami I bow to the Dhamma. Supatipano Bhagavato Sawata Sanko, the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, Sankhan Namami, I bow to the Sankhan. Well, sister, I'd like to thank you very much for leading this evening's class. Uh, just want to really, I suppose, <coughs> share um, the feeling of um, how beautifully you convey the Dhamma, how touchingly and uh, gently and kindly and wisely. And thank you for, for, for coming and, uh, and joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again on another evening of ours. Thank you, Nick. Thank and you. All the very best to everybody. Yes, Keep thanks. practicing. <laughs> we will, we will. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Imogen and uh, Lavinia and the sort of backroom people, including Odin and Wing, uh, Wing Du. And um, just wanted to mention that next week's class will be taken by Martin and uh, the, these will continue, these Monday classes, right up to the Christmas break. And we look forward to having many people join us uh, on future events. So thank you very much indeed again, sister. Okay. Oh, I just should mention also that the address, we've put the email address up from the room um, on the, in the chat. So we'll leave the, um, the, the session running so that if you want to make a note of it, it's there in the, in the chat, the, the, the address to send inquiries to Sister Chandasiri. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Always a very strange moment when we all disappear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.